All right, part two. So we're going down lower now. So we're below the, uh, the uh, uh, molar uh, of the ice cream cone, the malleus and the incus uh, higher up and the additus. The O-plane uh, primarily is uh, recognized by noticing that you're at the level of the vestibule, the oval window, and the stapes foot plate. And also since you're at the level of the vestibule, the internal auditory canal is visible more immediately. And here we see, uh, we're below uh, the part of the ossicles where you see the head of the malleus and the body of the incus. We now see the anteriorly, the maneuvering of the malleus and the uh, long process of the incus, which articulates with the stapes, which you can see very nicely here as a horseshoe through the lenticular process of the incus and the incutostapedia joint. And you can see the cochlea in the vestibule. We can also see the internal auditory canal. Also, just to point out a structure I'm not going to talk about too much today, maybe a little later, this is the vestibular aqueduct uh, that uh, communicates uh, uh, between the uh, endolymphatic sac, which is a soft tissue structure that sits along the posterior petrous slope and the vestibule more anteriorly. So what conditions do we often see at the level of the uh, oval window? Otosclerosis is a good example, there are many. This is a genetically mediated metabolic disease that actually affects only the human otocapsule and ossicles. It's autosomal dominant with variable penetrance and expressivity. Women are affected uh, twice as often as men and 80% of the time it's bilateral. Often there's a positive family history and symptoms tend to present in the second and third decades, typically with slowly progressive con conductive hearing loss, which is bilateral in most patients. Uh, clinicians, if they look through the tympanic membrane, may see a reddish uh, U behind the tympanic membrane due to uh, active demineralization in bone along the cochlear promontory, which is usually where otosclerosis begins. Uh, there are two basic uh, types. The one we're talking about, where you typically will see a reddish discoloration of uh, 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 bone is called fenestral otosclerosis from the French, uh, la fenêtre in French is a, is a window, and it's the most common type. Um, you can see ultimately uh, later in the course of the disease fixation or bony uh, solidification of the stapes at the oval window, but early on in the disease you'll see a lytic phase where you see bony demineralization. And conductive hearing loss may be found in either the early or the late phases. In the late phase where the stapes is fixated, uh, you can try to restore conductive hearing by uh, resecting the uh, solidified stapes foot plate and putting uh, a prosthesis in its place to try to restore the motion that you need to get uh, hearing uh, transmitted from the outside world. Uh, retrofenestral otosclerosis or cochlear otosclerosis is a demineralizing process that may eventually uh, become sclerotic that involves the uh, bone around the cochlea, which of course is the otocapsid. And because of uh, changes that involve the soft tissue structures in the inner ear, uh, you may also get sensory neural hearing loss. Uh, and we'll show you an example of that as well. Um, focal uh, fenestral otosclerosis typically be begins at the anterior superior margin of the uh, cochlea uh, near the middle ear in an area of embryologic cartilage called the fistula antifenestrum. It's uh, near the cochleariform process. It's the last region to undergo endochondral bone formation in the labyrinth, and therefore you may have persistent embryonic tissue that is often the site that otosclerosis begins in. If otosclerosis does not begin at the fistula, it may begin at the round window niche, it may be isolated in the ossicles, the stapes, and so on. So it's not always in this area, but it's typically in this area, and this is the area to look. So this is uh, an example of demineralization in the early phase of fenestral otosclerosis. You have two transverse axial CT cuts, and at the bottom, two coronal cuts. Uh, there's a normal coronal bottom right and an abnormal coronal bottom left. Notice that the oval window is much wider 
in this uh, case of otosclerosis than it is on the normal image because of the mineralization. Also on the axial view, you can see the typical the typical location of demineralization at the anterior, uh, uh, at, at the lateral aspect of the cochlea, where the arrow is pointing, uh, that's the location of the fistula antifenestrum. So this is a fairly common pattern of uh, uh, early fenestral otosclerosis. Later on, you can see in the diagram that now the stapes foot plate is uh, uh, solidified into the bone around it. The yellow arrow is pointing at that solid, thickened area of demineralized bone that is not quite as dense as the rest of the otocapsule. So in the later phase when uh, you get sclerosis, it still typically is recognizable as a slightly different density than the denser, more immediately located otocapsule. And at the risk of uh, moving the slides inadvertently again, I'll point to uh, this concretion of bone at the oval window that it is obliterating most of what you'd ordinarily see as a lucent window. So that's finasteral otosclerosis in a later phase. State piece uh, reconstruction may be done. It uh, uh, usually involves resection of all or part of the state piece foot plate, which opens the oval window and allows uh, uh, that continuity we described. Just an example of a metallic uh, state piece prosthesis. Uh, a PORP or partial ossicular replacement prosthesis involves replacing only part of the ossicular chain. If you uh, uh, had no ossicles left and wanted to replace the whole chain, it would be a TORP or a total ossicular prosthesis. And you can see this is a late case of otosclerosis. There's a huge amount of bone that's built up here over the cochlear. Uh, all of this is abnormal bone and that's been drilled out posteriorly and you can see the prosthesis at the level of the oval window behind that thickened bone. And this helped restore conductive hearing loss. Uh, this is an excellent reference article, if you'd like. It's not new, but it's still really good. Uh, done by Jeff Stone, uh, Suresh Mukherjee, and others. Uh, Mauricio Castillo, who recently stepped down as editor of the American Journal of Neurodiology, was a senior author from Radiographics in the year 2000, talking about uh, what you need uh, to comment on and what the otologist needs to know in evaluating uh, uh, prosthetic uh, ossicular reconstruction procedures. Uh, and in this case, uh, from their article, you can see a coronal plane image showing uh, the long arrow is where the, uh, the bony prosthesis had been placed. You can see that it's been dislocated and angulated inferiorly. So now that uh, prosthetic bone is overlying the uh, cochlear promontory and not uh, in its proper location. Most ossicular uh, prosthetic dislocations do occur in this fashion uh, with an inferior dislocation. Uh, this is a case that we had years ago where we had a patient who had had a metal prosthesis. The patient uh, presented with acute vertigo, tinnitus, and disequilibrium. And you can see that that metallic prosthesis is now deep to the plane of the oval window, protruding into the soft tissues of the vestibule. Uh, that caused uh, the patient's symptoms. And in these cases, it's not correct to say, well, let's just remove it, because you may create uh, uh, what's called a CSF gusher. If you uh, know that a CSF is uh, in balance with the endolymph and perilymph in the inner ear, and if you create a hole in the oval window, a fluid may continually leak into the middle ear. That creates a, a, a huge problem. Uh, so you try to get away with uh, conservative treatment with steroids, uh, but it, it's a serious issue that uh, may eventually need surgical correction if conservative measures don't work. This is another uh, stapes uh, prosthesis, but it's actually located okay. It's not been displaced immediately but it's meant to show another uh, CT finding in patients not with the uh, fenestral otosclerosis that led to the ossicular placement, but to the deeper uh, form of otosclerosis, uh, retrofenestral or cochlear otosclerosis. If you've, uh, you've had time to look at the image now, and you may have noticed that generally the bone around the cochlea is uniformly hyperdense. In this case, there's a rim of low density, 
that sort of looks like a target. This is the typical pattern of retrofenestrial or cochlear otosclerosis in the early demineralizing phase. So uh, other things may demineralize the otocapsule, but usually not in this pattern. Uh, Paget's disease may cause demineralization of the Petrus pyramid, but uh, Paget's disease, if it demineralizes the bone around the cochlea, will already have caused universal demineralization of the temporal bone because the demineralization starts peripherally and works its way in. So because there's still a lot of normal bone around uh, the area of demineralization, this could not be Paget's disease of the temporal bone. So it helps you in differential diagnostic considerations. Just for fun, I thought I'd put in a slide about famous people who have had otosclerosis, Howard Hughes. Uh, uh, and uh, it's not proven, but it's thought that the most likely reason that Beethoven had hearing loss was uh, otosclerosis, but again, that's not really proven, it's controversial. Uh, Frankie Valli, um, uh, the lead singer of the Four Seasons, um, I don't know if you've seen the movie Jersey Boys, uh, which was the story of the Four Seasons uh, music group, suffered from otosclerosis and for a while had to sing from memory um, and eventually had his hearing restored by an osteocular prosthesis. And in popular culture, not a real person, but uh, Gil Grissom, who was a character in the series uh, CSI Crime Investigation, was uh, the script uh, said that he had otosclerosis, which he inherited from his mother. Remember, this is more common in women. And at the end of the third season, he underwent a stapedectomy. It's wonderful how uh, real things translate into fiction. Um, other things that can affect the uh, O plane or any plane really are fractures. We're not going to spend uh, a lot of time. I don't have a lot of time to go into it, but you can see fractures through the temporal bone, here through the roof of the external canal with fluid, blood in the middle ear. The ossicles are dislocated. Uh, here you can see separation of the malleus and incus in the coronal plane. So fractures are common things that CT of the temporal bone is done for. And of course, we'd prefer to do CT in patients with trauma as the first study. Uh, uh, because of its uh, exquisite uh, ability to depict bony abnormalities. Um, <clears throat> other things that can affect uh, the O-plane at the level of the oval window, uh, take a look at this image for a while. You know, it just doesn't look like all those other CAT scans I've been showing you. The cochlea doesn't have partitions. We don't see the cochlear medialis. The, the vestibule just looks too big and unusually formed. And if you look at the, uh, the uh, horseshoe shape of the stapes, it's filled in. There should be air inside of the horseshoe. So there's a soft tissue structure that's coursing through the stapes in the middle ear in this case. Again, look at the malformed cochlean vestibule. Uh, we don't see the turns of the cochlea and uh, Turns out this is uh, a variant of Mondini malformation. It's basically a developmental anomaly of the cochlea and the vestibule. And uh, the reason that uh, you don't see uh, the air uh, within the horseshoe is there is a persistent stapedial artery, which may be associated with developmental anomalies of the temporal bone. But it's certainly worth at least realizing that this must be a developmental abnormality. We're not seeing the normal structure of the bone. This isn't an acquired erosive process. Uh, Mondini actually uh, described a very specific anomaly of the inner ear. Uh, his original description refers to a vestibule larger than the normal size and a cochlea with only one and a half turns. But over time, the term has been used uh, more generally and probably incorrectly, it's become more ambiguous and it's been used to describe a wider variety of cochlear anomalies. So it really should be reserved for a cochlea showing an incomplete partition, the absence of the interscalar septum, uh, which results in confluence of the apical and middle turns. Mondini malformations uh, is associated in 20% of cases with anomalies of the vestibule, the semicircular canals, and the endolymphatic duct and sac. In this case, we mentioned the primitive stapedial artery uh, traversing through the, uh, through the uh, stapes uh, 
and uh, you can read through this. Uh, there are uh, schematic representations here from uh, an article by, by Pierre Lajunias, a, a wonderfully uh, 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 talented uh, French anatomist who worked uh, with a number of radiologists in the early days of interventional radiology, working at the fine vascular anatomy that we all had to learn to be able to do our trade. Uh, he unfortunately died uh, premature and early death uh, many years ago, but uh, I'll, I'll give him a call out because he was a terrific guy. And he did this article back in the 70s uh, about uh, various uh, things that can be uh, seen with um, uh, persistent superior artery and aberrant internal carotid arteries. Uh, and it's beyond the scope of this talk to really go into this in too much detail, but they are related. So not only can you have inner ear anomalies associated with persistent superior artery, but also uh, abnormal course of the internal carotid artery through the temporal bone. I wanted to talk a bit about the vestibular aqueduct because you can see this at the level of the lateral semicircular canal in the vestibule, and it's a very important uh, structure. And there are uh, key uh, pathologies, particularly in children, associated with its uh, malformation. The vestibular aqueduct uh, connects the vestibule to the cranial cavity. It contains the lymphatic sac, uh, endophytic duct, uh, which begins at the union of the utricular and saccular ducts and it's directly connected to the membranous labyrinth. The duct empties into the endolymphatic sac uh, posteriorly and is invested with endura, endura so that, uh, uh, that, uh, that membrane of the sac is uh, permeable, and CSF, which of course is present uh, on its posterior margin, is filtered through the membrane, and uh, that's how, as I mentioned before, CSF is in balance with uh, perilymph and endolymph within the inner ear. It serves to equalize pressure between the endolymph and CSF and is involved in endolymph absorption. 